a dimmer from eBay. Let me show you the listing this came from. So it's listed as 904 AC 250 volt. I mean, there's probably a slight component variation available for the 120 volt version. 2 amp, which seems quite generous given it's got a tiny little triac in it. Manual knob, floor, table lamp in line 15 to 60 watt dimmer switch S and K. And that was shoes.kingdom. Uh, 15 to 60 watt, that's nowhere near 2 amps. 2 amps would have been 500 watts in the UK, but to be honest, 15 to 60 watt, that seems reasonable. And I got the transparent one because the transparent one looks the best. Oh, and it was £2.09. So here it is. And you may hear the soda on the background because this is not what you call a consumer friendly product. It's a, got the rotary selector, the rotor, rotary control with the switch position. And you open it up and you break the flex going through it, but you have to solder it. Not only that, you have to either splice the other connector in the flex or sort of, well, let's try terminate it. Let's open it up for a start. And I shall put it into this handy cable with a lamp and we'll test it and see how smoothly it dims. You can even... Uh, you can look right through the case and you can actually see circuitry in this. It's very straightforward with a tiny little track. So let's terminate this then. So here is my choice of lamp. It's a tungsten lamp, but it's the type that is adaptable. It's actually got the quartz capsule in it. And then you can put the cover of your choice over it. You can get quite large ornate covers. I think that one might have come from Asda, not sure. And if I plug that in at the moment, it's just, well, it's, it's a lamp, and that's uh, about all you can say about it. So in order to actually put this in line, I'm going to have to slit the cable without actually breaking the inner conductors. It's just it's so many opportunities to go wrong. So let's uh, bring out this, the maker knife and flick it out. Uh, work out how much I want to strip here and then carefully try and slice it down the middle. I'm guessing that if this was being done in a factory that makes light fittings, they might have a dedicated piece of apparatus for doing this. Let's grab a pair of long nose pliers and try and uh, find where I've just slipped that. Where did I just slit it? I think it was there. Yes, it was. So not the easiest thing in the world. The risk of slicing, slicing into other conductors is quite high. Okay. So I'm going to cut that there. And I'm going to try and work out, I need the cable. The cable has to go to these two solder connections here, which is actually not ideal. Okay. And I'm not sure, does the cable, I'm guessing the cable just goes over the top. How much space do I have here? Not a huge amount of space over the top. That's all right. It's enough for the wires. So I shall break the live conductor or whichever one I've already chaffed. No, that looks pretty good. Uh, I shall cut that like that, like that. Incoming supply will go to say there. Uh, okay, so I'll cut that like that. Strip it just to just enough to solder, not that much. I shall tin it. This is the point at which MD buying this thinking they were just going to snap it in line or just use IDC connections where when you close it down it automatically pierces the conductors. They're going to be disappointed. I wonder what they'd actually do. Maybe. At the very worst they'd connect both the lives to this one and both neutrals to that one. I bet that's happened, which would have resulted in a bit of a pop when it was turned on and would blow all the tracks off the circuit board. Let's tin this, just in case it's not juicy lead-based soda, though to be honest it looks so shiny and perfect that it is most likely lead-based soda. Oh, you know what? Before I do this, I'm just going to pause and take some pictures of this module so that we can reverse engineer afterwards, so I'll just pause momentarily. The pictures have been taken, let the video resume and we shall reverse engineer it after we've tested to see if it's any good at all. So I'm just going to solder. Now, I notice for a start that the... I can show you the pictures. I can show you this one now. Where is it? Uh, 
I can show you that these have the fairly common arrangement that the track, the large pad for poking the cable through, has a break in it. I'm guessing this might be for avoiding that situation that when it heats up, it kind of stresses the uh, copper layer and actually makes it part from the PCB. I'm not really sure about that. And I'm not sure at all. I don't know why they do that. I've never done it myself with large connections. There must be some logical reason they do it. So I shall blob that on there. It doesn't really matter. A, it doesn't matter if you use this on li the switch on live or neutral, though it's preferable to do it in live. Or which way around this goes, because it's AC. It doesn't really matter which way around it is. It doesn't care. So, which is going to be... Ugh, this isn't great, is it? Yeah, that should work. Let us uh, put the lid on and see what happens. I'm trying not to actually pierce solder connections underneath this uh, cover. And make sure I do grip it properly. I think, uh, in hindsight, I'd have probably trimmed it differently, but I'm not really sure. Oh, that's uh, the first slight obstacle there is this uh, screw pillar. Ugh. Okay, let's get the screws in and then test it out. And then we'll reverse engineer it and see what circuitry is like. Looking at it so far, the circuitry is extremely simple. I'm just looking at this cable running over the top of here and thinking I don't really want to uh, pierce that. Maybe it will be insulation displacement, but not the insulation I wanted to be displaced and, the, and definitely not the electrical connection I wanted to, to make in there. But we shall find out when I plug it in. I'm noticing that when it arrived, the case paths were not fully tightened together. They just put the screws in just enough to hold them. Well, that is squishing quite tightly. There's a risk that it's actually piercing through. Oh, well, I wonder how many people will put it together and it will go bang. Just because they pierce the connector. So let's plug it in and turn it on. OK, so... It starts off quite low, it winds up, it goes to pretty much full brightness by the look of it. That works. Okay, well now I've proven it works. Let's take a look at the circuitry and reverse engineer it. Now I have looked, I'll turn the solder iron off as well because it's humming away in the background. I shall pop the screwdrivers to the side, I shall pop this down, I shall pop this up here, just leave it as set dressing. Let's bring in the pictures, and I shall bring in my notepad. Now, I've looked at various dimmers before, but uh, it's worth looking at another one and going over it again, because it's one of these things that the circuitry is not very complex. Let's focus down. Let's take the exposure off just a tad as well. Let's focus there and lock. Uh, it's worth reverse engineering a few times, because every time I do it, things might make a little bit more sense of how it works. So I have taken a picture of the front of the circuit board here, but I flipped the back of this image so that it correlates. So those two big solder connections are these two connections here. These connections here are the capacitor. Um, and this bit marked F1 is these two pads here with a really big fuse in them. Yeah, that's a huge fuse. Uh, so we can basically say the tracks are the fuse. So this potentiometer here, which looks a bit out of focus just because it's so far above the circuit board, has the two functions. It's got the resistor and the wiper arm. So this is basically a resistor that would normally be going from here to a third pin there that's missing. And then you've got the wiper arm that then goes across to the middle. So when you turn the knob, this between these two pads varies in resistance. And it says 500k, so it's 500,000 ohms. Here, though, we've got a switch, and the switch is the clicky bit that when you actually turn this, it makes that clicking noise, and that disconnects it completely. So say we've got live coming in here. We go through what would have been a fuse if they'd actually put a fuse on. I guess they've just changed the design of the circuit board. They, they've just left those pads on. I'm not sure why they've done that. They've gone through this 
uh, switch here, there is another pad over there. That's reason enough. I know what that is now. So let me just work this out. Here is the triac down here. And the middle terminal is the gate. The terminals, we've got MT1 and MT2. Resistor, resistor going to gate relative to... I reckon this is MT1. I shall explain this afterwards, and this is MT2. Main terminal 1, main terminal 2, it's how they label tracks. We've got the supply coming across the track, but it's also going through a resistor tucked behind here. And the value of that resistor, it, that resistor is actually tucked under here. And the value of that resistor was 20k. So we've got 20k, we've got 500k here. And that then uh, goes, so it jumps across, goes through that resistor, goes through the variable resistor, and then goes to this junction here, which has this capacitor in here, which has a value of 68 nanofarad. And then there's a device called a DIAC here, which looks a bit like a track with just two terminals. That is the layout on the circuit board. Now let's put it onto a schematic and we shall follow it through and see how it works. So there's live in, and it goes straight to the track. Now the symbol of the track looks like this. And the track's quite an interesting device. So load. The track's an interesting device because it has a couple of unusual characteristics. It can switch on AC, so it can switch on either polarity, and likewise, the gate, which is this down here, this is MT1, MT2. The important bit here is that the gate is referenced to MT1. And if you take the gate positive with re reference to MT1, it can turn the track on. If you take it negative, it can turn the track on. Usually, there's a certain, there's a combination that uh, in modern tracks, just for reliability, they've actually knocked one of those, what they call quadrants off. Quadrants means that when the, uh, this is positive, that can be either positive or negative with respect to MT1. And when this is negative, that can be positive or negative with respect to MT1. But because of the design of them, there was always one of those quadrants took a really high current to trigger it. And the most of the modern systems tend to base the gate. They tend to get its uh, voltage, its current, from MT2. So typically speaking, it's optimized for operating in that sort of style. So what we have here, we have... Well, for a start, we've got a switch, which uh, I've already missed out. So there's the switch. And the switch comes through, and then there's that resistor, the 20K. And the whole point of the 20K is it limits how uh, dim it can go. And also, it prevents uh, too much current flowing into the circuit, as I shall show now. So here's that's the fixed resistor, the one that's underneath this potentiometer. Then we've got the potentiometer itself, and this end of the potentiometer is not connected, so it's just acting as a simple variable resistor. And then that's going down to a capacitor, which is 68 nanofarts. So that's 500k. And then we've got the DIAC here. The DIAC looks like a track with just two leads, but... It's quite interesting in the sense that it's got a threshold voltage, typically, let's say, about 32 volts. And when it reaches that voltage, it suddenly turns on and uh, it delivers a current spike from this capacitor to the track, turning it on. So on each half of the sine wave, as the voltage increases across the sine wave, this capacitor will charge through these resistors. Now, that's the reason that resistor can't just be zero ohms, because if it you, there's a risk that if it was zero ohms and you turned the potentiometer right up to the point it was right at the end here, it would be connected directly to the sort of live rail and too much current would flow. It would basically, it would go straight through the uh, DIAC and there'd be nothing to limit the current, so it would potentially damage the DIAC and the TRIAC. So they have a fixed value resistor which also determines how far into the sine wave it can trigger. When it's charged this capacitor up high enough, that uh, DIAC conducts and it triggers the triac. And what happens there is that if you had it in the midway setting, uh, 
It would maybe be up in the middle of this sine wave that it would trigger. And the output would go from just being off, it would suddenly go on at that point and then follow that sine wave down. And then it would go on to the other half of the sine wave and it would do the whole lot in reverse and you'd get that sort of firing in the same sort of way so it would be effectively half intense because it was on half time. The triac has this interesting characteristic that once you've triggered it, it will stay on until the current flowing through it goes to zero. So what actually happens here is that this charges the capacitor, the capacitor suddenly discharges, gives it a spike, turns it on, but uh, at that point it shunts these two rails because that's uh, this is in series of the load. And therefore this doesn't this circuitry becomes sort of inactive after that until the next cycle. But um that means that it only does fire one spike. When that uh, turns on the mid-position, it literally is just a spike like that that fires it on and then a, a spike in the other half as well that fires the other half, except opposite polarity. And uh, that's why sometimes when you plug it on with odd loads, let me think of an odd load. Let me go and see if I can find an unusual load that this is going to be unhappy with. One moment, please. One suitable demonstration lab. I've chosen one with a capacitive dropper in it. It's the worst type of load you could use with a dimmer because particularly when you've got a large array of LEDs, so it doesn't even start conducting through the LEDs until you're well into the sine wave. It's also bad news for the capacitive dropper itself. It doesn't like it because because this is turning on in sharp spikes, it can actually damage this sort of circuitry in it. But if I turn this on now, it's very glitchy. It's flickering. It's intermittent. And as I turn it up, it goes and bursts and then it starts strobing and flickering and then finally at the very end it kind of works but there's certain points that a very visible shimmer is visible. It's not very happy is it? What's happening there is the lamp, the triax getting its pulse and it's trying to turn on, it does turn on, current starts flowing but then all it manages to do is charge capacitor a bit in this but it's not going to conduct through the LEDs so then uh, because there's no current flowing after that point, the track just turns off again and you get an odd situation. It's particularly an issue with transformers with these uh, sort of triac based dimmers that you can end up the situation that because the track can switch on both half waves, but all, isn't always symmetrical in doing so in its triggering uh, way and its latching way, it can result in a situation that at certain levels, it can run a transformer half wave. It can latch on one half wave of the transformer, but not another half. You need special dimmers for inductive loads. And likewise, you need special dimmers. Well, not any dimmer at all for a capacitive dropper. They're really not suitable for dimming. I suppose reverse phase might work with a capacitive dropper, but it, it ramps up and then cuts off. I've never really tried that. But uh, this is not a, a complicated dimmer. So that's uh, how this little dimmer works. It is the most absolute basic circuitry. And uh, it does have the other downside. It doesn't have suppression. And because this is one of these dimmers that turns on in the middle, say, for instance, at that sort of theory, the sort of mid-intensity setting where it turns on at the peak of the sine wave, it's going from uh, zero load up to absolutely full load instantly in a straight line at that point and it results in a lot of electrical noise and that's where you'd normally have an inductor uh, in series of the circuit plus extra capacitive filtering across it to actually try and get rid of that noise uh, and stop it jamming radios. More of an issue for radio hams to be honest. I don't know how many people still use uh, the sort of radio bands that used to be the most susceptible to that dimming. I can recall that uh, to test my own dimming circuitry when I was building uh, animation controllers, light controllers, that did dimming, I got a shitty radio, tuned it way off frequency so it was the most susceptible to any noise, and then just worked on uh, the inductors and the capacitors until I managed to suppress all that noise down to an absolute minimum from the radio. I got rid of it completely, in fact. It was quite impressive. But there we go. A little inline dimmer, but not really suitable for for your granny. It's the sort of thing that if you want to actually put it in, you're going to have to be able to solder and understand how to strip cable back and in the sort of midpoint and then uh, splice it through. It would have been quite nice if they just extended the circuit board up a bit, given it's soldered anyway, and just added a couple more solder points so that you could actually uh, just basically break the live and the neutral through. It would have made it somewhat easier to terminate. But there we go. 
It's interesting. It's what you get for two pounds, and I suppose for that it's okay. No suppression or anything, but you know what? It is what it is. It's a cheap inline dimmer. Uh-oh. Bonus extra footage. So having a... Reterminated this, well, not reterminated, just stripped the sleeving back inside. I thought, okay, let's stick this lamp in and try it again, just randomly. And I turned it on, and this is it at its lowest setting. Oh, do you see that flicker off a tungsten lamp? Uh, and it now goes from about half intensity up to more or less full intensity, but keeps flickering because it's broken. Uh, it will still turn off at the lowest setting because, well, when the switch setting, but it's now misfiring completely. And I have a horrible feeling that it's done that thing where the track has failed because it didn't like the current spikes into the capacitive dropper because it was basically a series of little short circuits it saw. And it's done that thing where there's now a sort of phantom diode effect inside the track and it's not one that I can actually measure with the con the continuity tester but that's the kind of thing it's doing it's just basically uh, just conducting half wave all the time and that's why even at the lowest setting it's lighting very brightly and shimmering visibly oh well that didn't last very long in the bin it goes